This is the Free Hill Life Podcast, episode number 150. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life Shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's a little bit cooler and a little bit closer to Telemark season, my friends. Super psyched to be here, as always, every Monday, talking about Telemark and all the good stuff going on, bringing you a little bit of the business side of the house and a little bit about just living that Free Hill Life out there. So, Thanks for tuning in to my Telemark Pirate Radio as you do each week, and I'm doing my best to bring you the goods. So thanks for uh, checking it out. So hopping into just uh, a couple things, uh, the fine people at 22 Designs have finally gotten us some Telemark bindings. And what that means for you is uh, we've got them in stock, hopefully by the time this uh, drops, but uh, they will go fast. So my hot tip for you this winter season is when you see gear that you want, get it. <laughs> so that's, uh, I think that's really going to be kind of the name of the game this year. Um, you know, still there's some supply chain issues and delivery issues and all sorts of fun stuff. So, uh, as we get stuff, we're going to be firing it out there, receiving it, getting it live and getting it to you. So make sure to, uh, hop on those chances when you see them and, uh, we'll do our best to, uh, keep it, keep it rolling. As far as other news, nothing too crazy right now. Uh, we are still trying to figure out a, an opening day for the Free Hill Life retail front. And that kind of coincides with just getting the gear in that we need to get to you. So uh, we're going to do our best. We might, might even uh, just be doing you know a day or two uh, a week towards the end of October just to kind of get the blood flowing. Uh, obviously, we're... Uh, a, always online, freeheallife.com, 24-7, 365 days a year. You can find the goodies there. Lots of plenty of new uh, awesome lifestyle merchandise. We're fully stocked up on Vole skis and Vole 75 millimeter bindings. So if that's your flavor, get after it. So today I'm going to kind of dive in on a very important topic, something close to my heart as all Telemark things are. And uh, going to chop it up a little bit about used gear and things to look for when you're shopping for used gear, uh, things to avoid when you're shopping for used gear, why used gear is important, and uh, just kind of a general overview on that topic. So just to start off, I want to say used gear is an incredibly, incredibly important part, in my opinion. Uh, for telemark in general and it always it goes back to the access issue you know how how do we how do we grow telemark and how do people access the equipment how do they get into the sport there's other there's other things that you know obviously go along with that that have to happen uh you know to learn how to make the turn uh how to improve uh all that good stuff and new equipment's incredibly important too but um, Telemark's unique in the sense that it doesn't really have an entry level uh, binding or entry level boot or entry level ski per se. Um, you know, I guess may maybe skis are a little a little different topic on that. But you know, um, there's not there's not just uh, now that's one of the things I've always re really respected about snowboarding over the years too is. Um, there's equipment that you can get into the newer equipment at, at a lower price. And, and some of it goes, you know, some of it just, you know, little side sidebar on that equipment is obviously expensive to make. And our equipment is very uh, <laughs> expensive. The boots, especially um, everybody seems to know that, but you know, there's just uh, there's a lot going on <laughs> to make boots and bindings do the things they do uh, so that we can drop knees everywhere. So the importance uh, of used gear in the market and having it circulate and, and having it be a good access for, point for people to get in, maybe if they don't have a rental fleet in the area that they live, um, or maybe they were able to find a rental and now they caught the bug 
and uh, you know, it's it's just a great way to get get started. And I think it's really important. That's that's why since you know since the day one in our retail front, uh, I wanted that to be something that we offered because it uh it really it really allows people to to come in and not i think feel overwhelmed in a retail space but it's also not just you know like a second hand shop um for those that are interested if you are one of our instagram followers we actually have an entirely separate page that you can follow it's at uh used telemark gear so check it out uh, we post on that daily, you know, and as things kind of ramp up and we're bringing more stuff in, that's something you definitely, definitely uh, want to follow if you're an Instagram follower. It's kind of a fun way. It's a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a, uh, I always say it's uh, the Instagram is uh, that particular Instagram is sort of a garage sale, you know, don't expect any uh, fancy content. <laughs> so I just want to make sure to keep uh, your expectations where they should be on that one but it's a great tool and a great way for us to kind of connect uh our used equipment uh in the retail space in salt lake uh and the stuff that you can find on freehealthlife.com in the used sections uh to you so you can see what's coming in and out and uh be keeping an eye on it so obviously being used gear it's you're getting into something maybe you you may or may not even know what you're getting. And I think hopefully the seasoned Telemark used gear buyer veteran, this probably could apply to you as well. Probably just brushing up on some topics that, uh, you know, you're, uh, you, you may already use in the marketplace. But I thought, you know, this is definitely good for, especially those first time, telemark skiers uh people coming from snowboard people coming from alpine skiing um sometimes people just starting skiing and get into telemark right from the get-go i have seen it i know someone's probably shaking their head out there like that's not possible uh i have seen that um having taught telemark lessons in the past it does happen (laughs) sometimes people just jump right into the deep end and uh much respect because uh yeah you can learn every turn on free hill equipment, which is great. So I want to kind of walk you through our methodology, sort of when we, uh, you know, we do consignment at the shop, uh, we buy and sell stuff as well. So I kind of want to walk you through sort of the method that we use, sort of the checkpoints we look for. I thought these could be kind of a good guide uh, in for you at, at home listening and uh, something that maybe you can use when uh, a good deal pops up or maybe it's a cool ski uh, that maybe you've been looking for um, or maybe it's just like how to put this first setup together. So I think the first thing to start with is, you know, price. I think that pricing is a, is a good place to start in terms of, you know, knowing what you're going to get into for what price point. And, you know, used gear obviously is a wide uh, array of of uh, types of products, things you're looking for. So let me start off just with the set the setup as a whole. Maybe how to approach that. I'm going to take it kind of from the perspective of that person that's you know looking online. Um, maybe uh, you're trying to find uh, find something you know as a whole package. And here's the thing: you get what you pay for for the most part, just like most things. Um, and there's different, the thing with telemark equipment is there's so many different eras of telemark equipment and each era sort of possesses a different type of feel or, you know, does different things or has, you know, different features. And these are things you're going to get to know over time. So the first thing I'd suggest is don't sweat the small stuff, especially if you're getting, you know, you're trying to find your first telemark package, for instance, Here's how I would approach it. This is how we we like to tell people that come into our retail front and try to help them. Um, the first thing you're going to see out there in general, and this is I'm, I'm speaking primarily to people uh, in North America and even more specifically in uh, in the United States, 
because it does differ um, as far as I've been able to sort of research and uh, tell over the years. You know, um, I think, you know, the U.S. is obviously, you know, this is a stronghold for Telemark skiers. There's a lot of people here <laughs> and there's a lot of ski areas uh, between, you know, the Pacific Northwest, West Coast, Rocky Mountains, um, Midwest, uh, East Coast, you know, New England. There's there's really quite a few zones that you're able to find gear because there's skiing going on. And wherever there are hills to slide down, there are Telemark skiers. Um, Canada is definitely got stuff. I'm not as familiar with the used market up there, but I know it's not as easy, you know, um, to find stuff tends to be a little more, uh, you know, I think again, on the West side of Canada, uh, it's, it's a little bit easier, you know, you get into BC, uh, Alberta, that stuff, Quebec, uh, those areas tend, I think a little bit easier zones to find stuff. Ontario definitely has a, a, a good, um, uh, a lot of telemark stuff going on, uh, over in that area as well. So there is equipment, but I don't think it's as easy to find Europe is kind of its own thing, you know, and for all the Europeans listening, um, yeah, f- send me feedback podcast at freehealthlife.com. What does used gear look like in your areas? Um, you know, and I'm, I'm going off some hearsay sometimes, you know, things, you know, times when I go visit, I'm always kind of curious, you know, um, because each country kind of seems unique in that way. I tend to see, uh, less used gear rolling around or maybe what I would perceive to be setups like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's kind of just my general overview of that. So getting into the package, one thing in in the U S that you're going to see a lot is still a lot of setups that come from kind of that early to mid two thousands. You know, I'd say that 1999 to 2010, you're going to see an enormous, enormous amount of used gear on the market because Telemark was so, like having an, a, a huge boom at that point. And the reason being is, you know, basically backcountry skiing grew through Telemark skiing. That's a quote from uh, my buddy, old Craig Dosty. And, uh, you know, it's apparent when you look for used gear on the market and Telemark equipment is unique, uh, in comparison to Alpine equipment, snowboard equipment, because, uh, a lot of the equipment works incredibly well. And the bindings are usable even from that era. Um, anybody familiar with Alpine skiing knows that there's, there's a pretty quick shelf life in comparison to an Alpine binding, you know, uh, I, I, obviously not familiar with the fixed heel equipment, <laughs> but you know, uh, shops are not going to work on certain bindings past a certain point. There's a, a lot more stringent rules and testing for old equipment like that. So, uh, Telemark's unique in that you can kind of keep it going. And, uh, there's not a lot of safety disadvantage per se. Uh, but there's, there's just a lot of that gear. So when I think about that early 2000s, you know, kind of chunk of time, let's say that first decade of the 2000s, what you're going to see are kind of classic setups. You're going to see a, a ton of G3 Targa bindings. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, you're going to see, you know, all 75 millimeter binding because NTN new Telemark norm bindings didn't even come out till 2008. And then there was, you know, various iterations on that. So that first decade, we're still talking about a lot of cable bindings and a lot of similar types of equipment. I think it's, it's starting to fade out a little bit more just because we're already, you know, two decades in, but I will say there's a lot out there and it's important to know what you're looking for. Um, and those, these setups are fine. We're going to talk about how to look at them and make sure you know what you're getting, but again, you're getting what you pay for, you know, uh, they're great entry setups, but there's things that you can do to kind of get in and maybe utilize, um, a low price point to kind of get some good deals and kind of put nice little packages together yourself. If it's not an entire package right off the bat. 
So as far as the actual price that you're going to be looking at is, you know, I think you can get in, depending on where you live and what kind of stuff is out there, you can get into, you know, skis, boots and bindings for anywhere from a couple hundred bucks, you know, all the way up. Uh, it doesn't mean, uh, it's, it, it doesn't, <laughs> I just keep wanting to emphasize that the, the get what you pay for kind of concept, but, um, don't be afraid to get in and, and get something. If you find a good deal, a lot of times I'll see this where, you know, people just offload their, that era of telemark gear. Cause it's sitting in their garage. They were getting after it in the early two thousands. And then, you know, they moved on you know, and, and aren't really using it anymore. That's a great time to kind of swoop in and, um, and check it out. So, uh, used gear is always out there too. Time frame, you know, I think, um, this, this time of year is great. I mean, that's kind of when it fires up around our place, uh, in terms of seeing a lot of used gear, obviously, because we're opening for the season, people start thinking snow, people want to start, uh, going and looking for gear to get onto the mountain. And, uh, that's a good time to be looking. So, places to look. Obviously there's all sorts of forums. If you're not, of course I want to promote, you know, shopping with us at freehilllife.com, but yeah, it's, it's out there and you can find it on all sorts of, uh, local, uh, sites and, and whatnot. So, uh, so let's get, let's get into the, that that's just kind of the general overview, like what to, uh, what to expect and just know that it's, it's out there and you can find it. Um, So I kind of want to start with that era because that early 2000s era, you're going to see a lot of stuff. And I brought up the G3 Targa. Uh, I want to, I want to focus right now on bindings. What do you want to look for in a binding? Cable bindings, uh, are, are very common from, uh, that era and probably the lowest price point. So again, going back to that, if, if you're that beginner or intermediate, telemark skier, the binding and the boot, that's the first thing we need to focus on. And what we want to do from a method, a method of looking at a binding is how do you look, how do you go over it and how do you kind of give it a once over and make sure everything's operating correctly. So I want to talk about cable bindings like the G3 Targa, Vole Hardwire, um, and other bindings that may have sort of a what we call a compression spring. It's enclosed in a little cartridge and the spring inside of it, we want to make sure it's operating. So, uh, off the top of my head, I'm thinking G3 Targa. I'm thinking Vole hardware, Vole three pin hardware, um, that kind of stuff. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at, I, I always go top to bottom. And this is how we kind of scope things out when they come into our retail space that we may be consigning for someone or, or uh, maybe we find a good product that we can resell or whatnot. So I always start at the toe and then I work back to the heel. Okay. So whether it's on a ski or not, you know, I want to kind of give this a once over and it's sort of like, you know, buying a car, pop the hood, make sure the engine's running, you know, kind of look at all the stuff, uh, make sure the tires are, are good. And, and, and that's what we're doing with the telemark binding. So I'll start right at the top, most, uh, at top being the, where your toe of, of the binding starts. So the first thing you want to check out is the metal and you want to look for cracks. You want to look for wear and tear. Um, and you want to make sure that it's still going to hold the boot correctly. Things aren't bent. Um, a lot of things happen that you, you wouldn't even consider, you know, maybe someone smashed something in a door or (laughs) backed, backed over it with their car or, you know, there's all sorts of random things that happen to toe pieces. Um, on a lot of these bindings that those pieces are replaceable. And that's also something I want to hit on is how easy is it to fix something? If you find it at a a reasonable cost, because that's where it can can get kind of tricky. But if we're going to start off with the toe of the binding, I'm looking at the, 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 where the, the toe box of the boots going to go where you're uh, specifically, I'm thinking 75 millimeter right off the bat. And I want to look at does a boot slip into the toe correctly? And th- does the bar that goes across the top of the toe, 
making sure that's not cracked. So looking at where, how the binding's constructed, you know, usually you've sort of got like a toe plate, so to speak. And then you've usually got a toe bar. If it's, if it's anything before like 1999, it might not even have a bar going across it. That's getting, a, that's getting into kind of more vintage, vintage stuff. Um, so those, that's what I'm going to look at. Usually there's not a lot of damage on those. Uh, and then the next thing I'm going to look at that kind of connects to that toe piece is the cable. Okay. So the G3 Targa is arguably, if not factually, <laughs> like the binding that has been sold the most uh, in all of Telemark history. So you see, for those that don't know that brand, it's it, the Targa is very easy to identify. It's usually got a red cable, although there are variations, but the red one is uh, the one everyone kind of knows. And the cable, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a plastic cable coated cable. Okay. So what you want to do is inspect that cable. Okay. And there's a couple reasons we want to do this is, uh, on a Targa, for instance, that cable runs through kind of below the toe piece and comes out of the side of that metal toe piece. And when you're doing the inspection of the metal Targas are known for the cables breaking. And usually it comes from where the cable exits the toe piece and comes out and then goes around the back, okay, of your foot. And what happens is on that particular binding, and this is why I want you looking at the toe pieces, is your feet are going back and forth, you know? When you're doing a lead change on telemark skis, one foot's going forward and then it's going back, and people that have a tight stance, meaning their feet are closer together, a lot of times there's a lot of wear and tear going on on the inside of that metal toe piece. And on the Targa, what's interesting is there's a, there's a, where that cable exits that metal part, that thing gets sharp and that's what you want to look for. And that's generally where you're going to start seeing at least a crack in the plastic on the cable, if not uh, fraying happening with the cable inside the plastic. And that's when it gets really bad. Okay. So examine the cable front to back and make sure it doesn't have cracks. And if it, ha if it does have cracks, is it already wearing on what's inside of that protective plastic coating? And on an older binding like that, so when I talk about a cable binding in that sense, like a Targa, here's the problem. Awesome if it's in great shape. If it's mint condition, you're gonna get, a, you might get a year or two of good life out of it. Uh, if it's already breaking or broken, definitely don't get it. <laughs> uh, unless you absolutely know you can get a cable because although these are incredibly easy to find, the parts are not easy to find. So again, you get what you pay for. You're paying, you're paying into an era of product that actually has no warranty. It's not made anymore. Even though the company exists, they do not make that product. So you got to be kind of careful because you don't want to get into something that you absolutely cannot fix. So that's kind of my first take. So go over the metal part of the toe box, make sure nothing's broken on that and make sure it doesn't have any sharp parts and then look at the cable and make sure that the cable is not frayed or cracked. And this goes for all that cable binding situation goes for anything like G3 Targa, um, all the way back through like Riva two, Riva one. I mean, those are really old. Like I said, those are vintage bindings and those cables don't exist as well. And they're very, very hard to find. And the next thing to look at with the cable is if you already have identified a boot or you have a boot that you're going to be using with that setup, make sure the length of the cable matches the boot. Okay. That's a big thing because you could easily <laughs> uh, get a cable that is too short or too long and it's not going to fasten to the boot. So when you're shopping for used gear, know, know what length of cable, uh, all of those old eras of cables that I'm describing, 
usually had a short, a standard, and a long cable. There are some adjustments that can happen. Um, we cover that on some YouTube stuff too, especially with the Targa, like how to shorten and how to lengthen the cable because there's kind of a nifty little system below that toe plate that, that can do it. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but it can be done, but you really want to make sure you're not, I mean, you're already getting into a product that's not replaceable or easily replaceable and you want to make sure it's the right size. So definitely scope that out. The last thing you're going to check is you kind of move down the binding and going, checking the cable is you're going to get to the heel lever. Okay. The heel lever is the part that fastens it to the back of your boot and heel levers come in a variety of different uh, configurations. Uh, most of them are some sort of plastic or I believe nylon, um, but they are not as durable as I think uh, people probably thought they were. It was probably more of a lightweight thing, honestly, and a cost thing. Uh, so heel levers in general, you want to look at those as well. Look for cracks, make sure all the screws are fastening it correctly. Make sure it's the right heel lever. Um, that's another thing is you kind of don't know where equipment has been. And if you're not familiar with bindings, a lot of times things don't match and, uh, that can affect performance too. So again, heel levers are not easy to find. Um, th this is one reason, uh, if you listened to a couple weeks ago, we talked about acquiring bluebird day gear, uh, which is an accessory company that uh, was started by Jeff Cox and uh, on the East coast. And uh, we're really, really excited about having that in our, uh, in our family of brands now, because one of the products we make is an aluminum universal heel lever. So uh, it, it's made exactly for this scenario is it's a durable aluminum heel lever that works with all these different types of bindings that you're going to find on the used market. And it's a way to give more life. If your cables are in good shape, the toe pieces are in good shape, all of that stuff, but you can't seem to find the right heel lever or you just are tired of snapping them in half and you're up at the hill and you have no backup. Uh, that's an amazing product to kind of bring more life to your binding and keep you going. So quick recap on the, on those bindings, toe box, cable, heel lever. That's really what you're looking at. Um, and the last thing on that is those compression springs that I brought up. Make sure that they spin. Okay. What I mean by spinning is, is it turning? Okay. So when, again, when we're looking at, uh, and I'm going to go in, into that, uh, volet product as well. So if you're looking at a switchback, any of, any of the volet 75 millimeter bindings, have that enclosed compression spring like the G3 Targa. Uh, <clears throat> Volet doesn't use uh, the traditional cable, uh, but you want to check and make sure that, that they spin. So on a cable binding like the G3 Targa, one of the things you want to do is, is it spinning freely or is it kind of spinning, but maybe it's catching a little bit, but it's still moving? That's okay. What you do not want is a seized cartridge. So the quick uh, kind of lowdown on that is what happens is even though the cartridges are enclosed, oftentimes what happens is water gets in there, especially, you know, spring skiing, people go out and they, you know, it's wet conditions and there's way for water to get in there. Uh, and then they get put in your garage and they bake uh, all summer long, or maybe you haven't used those skis for five years and now they have completely rusted on the inside and are not spinning. Okay. So here's your quick little hot tip is end of, for those that this is kind of a maintenance tip, but uh, what you want to do uh, in the spring is unthread those and put a little, we use a Marine grease usually, uh, to, uh, it's just like a little tube of grease that you can get from, you know, uh, home Depot or wherever. And, you know, pull those springs off thread. Uh, I'm sorry, take the threads and dip them in that Marine grease and then thread them on. And that's a great way to store them to make sure the lubrication's in there and it's not going to rust. Okay. 
if you start twisting, like let's say you're out shopping around and you found this cool pair of skis and bindings, you're doing this once over and you're like, Josh said to check this and this. Well, when you get to the springs to adjust them, if you start twisting it to adjust the, the spring, righty tighty, lefty loosey kind of thing, and you start seeing that, that the cable starts twisting with the motion and the cartridge is not freely spinning, that's a big red flag, okay? Now, if, if you've already got the skis <laughs> and that's happening, uh, what you can do is, you know, take some WD-40 or some, uh, you know, there's some other sort of rust-breaking lubrication. You can spray them inside those cartridges and let them sit overnight and then try to break it free. Uh, it, that is not a guarantee, though. So don't pick up a pair of bindings that are seized up and expect that you're just going to be able to break it free. Um, the, uh, they can really get rusted inside of those cartridges and make it incredibly difficult uh, to get them going again. And that is not what you want. So that's kind of the last checkpoint. And honestly, probably one of the major ones is on most of these bindings that have a cable binding, if you have a seized cartridge, it's likely that you're going to actually have to cut the cable which then takes us back to that situation where you can't get the cable and it's not replaceable. And so when you're looking at these older, almost vintage bindings at this point, be sure what you're getting into is, is operating correctly and is in good shape. So other, other cable bindings, I just want to kind of give uh, a nod to that are good out there and maybe have uh, some, maintenance maintenance it's a little bit easier and uh, maybe don't get damaged as easily like i said a lot of those volet bindings are great they went to what what's what we call a hard wire instead of a uh, uh, a floppy type of cable and those are great um, the cartridges still can get seized up uh, but so you want to check those uh, but it's not likely that the the i'm sorry the <laughs> i'm blanking out here uh the uh the hard wires aren't usually going to be broken they can get bent though and the bent a bent hard wire uh is is hard sometimes it makes it hard to to adjust the binding so same thing just once over make sure stuff's moving correctly um you know maybe a little bit of uh grease can help kind of rehabilitate stuff and get it going. And, and like I said, frankly, it's just a maintenance thing that most people don't think to do. And they just kind of keep going and going. And next thing you know, they have a binding they can't operate. So, uh, other 75 millimeter bindings that are really great bindings to look for, uh, but maybe are harder to find parts are stuff like Black Diamond's old bindings. Again, Black Diamond does not make any bindings. They haven't for many, many years. But the Black Diamond 02, which is a blue binding, that's got two cables that run underneath the foot with two compression springs. That's a great one. Uh, the touring versions, the 01, also a ton of those on the market, and it's got free pivot touring. So that's, that's a cool option if you want to get into something that uh, is older, but uh, has that touring capability. So those are, those are some of the, the bindings to look for. If you can find it, one of the hot items that, that I've seen since we started doing free Hill life and started really getting into used gears, hammerhead, which is become a cult classic people that ski hammerhead, which was originally Russell rainy or rainy designs. And then later became the first binding that carried over under the banner of 22 designs awesome, awesome binding, uh, incredibly well-made, really stands the test of time, really hard to find parts. <laughs> so, you know, uh, again, if you're looking for used parts for these types of bindings, we carry uh, a deep, deep catalog of used parts that you can find on freehealllife.com. But I will say certain things like hammerhead parts are not easy to come by. And a lot of things like G3 cables are hard to come by. So, uh, if we don't have it at our shop, 
it is unlikely you're going to find it elsewhere. If you call Volet, they'll probably send you to us for old stuff. <laughs> you know, you call Black Diamond, they're probably going to send you to us. So be sure to, to look at that, uh, those types of things and make sure, you know, ask us, you know, you can reach out to, uh, you know, uh, our support desk, customer service at freehealllife.com and just say, Hey, I'm going to go look for this stuff, but can, can I find parts for these things? You may, you may think you can find parts and you might get the binding and realize you can't. So super important, uh, to, to do that. Now being in 2022, there are tons of used axles by 22 designs, vice bindings. Uh, these are very, uh, yeah, these, these are amazing bindings that are still made uh, along with a lot of the volet bindings like we just said we, we have in stock. You know, if, if I'm looking for used stuff now that I, I know is going to last for a good amount of time because I can get new parts for it, those are kind of the ones I would stick to personally. Uh, but again, you get what you pay for and you're paying, you might be paying a little bit more money for a used binding that's still in production at some level and you can access the parts. And that's, that's really what's most important is, is the binding going to be able to keep going for a while? So moving into the next piece of gear that's really important is boots and boots, same, same method we're using here. We're going to start at the toe and kind of work back to the heel of the boot. And then we're going to kind of go into the insides of the boot and see what we can come up with. So basically what we're, what we're looking at on a boot, there's a couple things when we started the toe and, and I'm going to, and this goes for 75 millimeter boots and then also NTM boots. If you're getting into that, look at the toe. And when I mean toe is on a 75 millimeter boot, the duck bill, look at the wear and tear on that stuff. Okay. Um, dents, what I would call like a dent in that 75 millimeter toe, not a huge deal, but there are certain bindings that are going to put little divots into it and whatnot. That's usually not too big of a deal, uh, especially in used, used gear. I mean, you're not going to, it might affect some little play in the toe box. Uh, and when you put it into the binding, are you going to notice maybe, uh, again, you're buying used equipment. So you just kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, little divots in there are not a big deal. Uh, worn Vibram, uh, also can be something that throws people off, you know, kind of by the three pin area on the boot. Uh, that, that can definitely affect the boot in some regards, but it's not, it's not a, again, if you're not spending a ton of money, I wouldn't worry about it. One thing I will say with soles on Telemark boots is it's incredibly hard to resole those boots and really give them life. There's, there's, there's a point where you just kind of want to move on. I think there's one person that I'm aware of up in, in the Northwest. I think it's Dave, Dave's cobbler. I always forget his name. Shout out to him. Cause I think he still, uh, resoles Vibram on Telemark boots. So, um, it is doable, not super easy to, to get done. So just keep that in mind. So the toe scope it out, make sure there's nothing going on. The really important one when you're buying a used boot is the bellows. So if you're not familiar with Telemark boots, the bellows are basically, some people call them like baffles, which I've, I don't know where that comes from, but we tend to, you know, use bellows, um, sort of that accordion section on the boot where it allows you to flex and, and drop your knee, uh, in, in a more natural way. You can't do that on, on a, an Alpine boot. So those bellows are important though, because that part can really break down. And you remember when I was talking about how toe boxes can kind of get, uh, sharpened up because your feet are hitting each other. A lot of times with boots that are old is you get a lot of wear and tear on the bellows. Okay. So bellows tend to kind of have like this round accordion vibe to them. And when you find boots that are very, very worn down, they'll actually start to go flat, okay? The flatness is not the end of the road per se, but it's getting close to it. And that's where you wanna really examine the, the, the bellows and make sure that where they're getting worn down, they're not cracking, okay? Or actually worn through where there's a hole. And you'll see this 
uh, next, you know, look at your boots that are at home if you've got them, uh, or if you're going out to look at used boots, keep that bellow picture in your mind. And, and just remember what I'm saying is you want to see a bellow that's not so flat or you'll start to see it go flat. And then there's like this little divot that will start. That is when the hole is starting to happen. So are those boots skiable beyond having a hole in them? Sure. Uh, do you want water in your boots while you're skiing? Probably not. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Um, you know, and giving more, sh- uh, you know, if, if there's wear and tear, you can get new bellow guards, which is sort of part of the tongue of the boot, so to speak. Uh, those are replaceable on certain models of boots. Again, if the boots are really old, they're probably not around. And that's not really something that you're going to be able to find unless you just find another set of old boots that match and you're able to sort of have a million parts. And I know there's some of you out there, you're not going to let, you know, you're not going down easy. The, the, it, there's going to be a fight to keep those boots alive. But my two cents on it, if you're getting to the point where <laughs> sometimes we'll see these funny pictures pop up on forums and on the internet and it's like, I mean, it's a picture of someone's boots and they're like, how do I fix this? And it's literally like the bellows are cracked. I mean, there's obviously going to be water going in there as the snow melts on your boots. At that point, get a new pair of boots. Um, It's going to save you a lot of time and headache and it's just not worth it. So boots are boots are, those are kind of the main things that I want to look out for sure. Um, The next thing you're going to do is you kind of move back through the boots, you know, again, look for cracks, wear and tear, uh, holes are not as likely outside of the bellow situation. It can happen on the insides of boots. Scuffing is going to happen. You just kind of have to expect that. But as we kind of get to the heel of the boot, a very, very important on, uh, important part of most telemark boots is the ski walk mechanism. And there's so many different variations of ski walk mechanism. It's a, it's a lever on the back. There's different configurations, depending if it's a Scarpa, Garmont, Scott, Crispy, but they all kind of operate the same way. And there's a little lever that usually flips up and allows free range movement of the cuff of the boot when you're walking around or touring, and then you lock it down. One thing you want to absolutely do, and you don't have to put your foot foot in the boot to make it work is flip that up and down and work the cuff and you'll hear it kind of click into place. You want to make sure that that's working because, uh, most of the mechanisms, uh, especially some of the older boots, there's like a little bar, a little metal kind of pin that is in there and those can break and they are replaceable, but again, it's not like an easy part to track down for a lot of vintages of boots. Uh, you know, it's like when they break, it's not a hard fix, but it's just hard to find the part and know how to do it if you've never done it before. So just check that ski walk mechanism and make sure that works. And that's kind of the outside portion of the boot on the lower part. Then you, then you want to start going through and check all the buckles. Buckles are another big item that not easily replaceable a lot of times because they're riveted on there. They're not easy to replace. Uh, They get twisted. They get bent. There's so many different things that can happen to buckles. (laughs) And, uh, you know, that's uh, actually something we've really tried to do is actually carry more of that type of stuff so that people can do modifications on their boots and do simple fixes. Uh, parts are available. Uh, most, you know, companies like Scarpa do have that stuff. They're not on their website and we've really tried to kind of dig in and make sure we have those. Um, so you can make replacements. Uh, I'm thinking kind of traditional buckles. A lot of them, some eras of boots like Scarpa have ratchet straps as well, which is kind of more, maybe what you'd see on like a snowboard binding or stuff. Once those, those are also good to check too. Lots of times there's stress cracks in there. They will break over time. Again, replaceable, hard to find. (laughs) So, uh, choose your battles wisely when it comes to like buckles and hard to find parts and that sort of thing. Uh, not the end of the world, but they can get bent and 
make uh, life kind of difficult. Uh, as we kind of go to the inner workings of the boot, the liner is a huge part that you want to check too. So uh, liners, pull them out of the boot and examine them. Many times you'll be surprised with used boots with what's going on in the liner because people obviously do a lot of boot work. Uh, liners can get kind of funny. You'll pull them out and all of a sudden they're covered in duct tape or I've found uh, people attaching plastic to you know, shim things. Um, another thing you want to do is always pull out the insoles. Uh, many times people sell their used boots and have some crazy, you know, insole that they left in there that's specific to their foot. And you're, you're looking at the size of this thing and you're like, yeah, this should totally be the right size. And then you realize there's like 10 shims inside of it, a custom foot bed. Uh, there's a million pieces of foam stuck to it. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, a lot of times you don't see it until you pull the liner out and kind of examine it. Also, uh, liners can have holes in them. Sometimes people cut holes in them themselves, you know, for boot heaters and all sorts of stuff. So, um, also, is it a moldable liner? Is it not moldable? Moldable liners can be remolded several, several times. Uh, I'll sell several, several is my very accurate description of how many times. <laughs> uh, you can remold old boots and usually get uh, a decent mold out of most of them. Again, you know, you start getting 20 years into an old boot. Don't, ex you know, don't expect that you're going to get everything you want, this custom fit and everything like that. Uh, some older boots don't have multiple liners and you just is what it is. And you want to keep that in mind as well, but it's just condition. And uh, while the liner's out, give it a, you know, shine a light, grab your phone, Use your flashlight, look inside, make sure there's no bolts floating around on the inside of the boot and uh, just kind of make sure it's functioning correctly. But that's kind of that's kind of how you do the once over on the boot is go toe to heel, then work up the, uh, check the ski walk mechanism, go up all of the buckles, double check and uh, pull the liner out, scope that out, make sure it's all working on the inside. And that's uh, that's kind of our basic method of, how to make sure uh, a used boot's functioning properly. And so with the boot and the binding sort of method of going over and making sure everything's okay, I mean, this is something you can do in five minutes on each thing, you know? So, you know, if you're, you know, you're, you're shopping for something, you don't need to take hours and hours to examine these things. They're all pretty easy to go through uh, and look at. And this is sort of just a guide to get you through how to check all that stuff and make sure it's working before you walk out the door with it. So I'm going to wrap this up with, with skis. Skis are an interesting one because when you're, when you're buying used skis, you know what you, you might be getting it in a package with a telemark binding on it. But one thing I always like to encourage people to, you know, when people are looking to get into telemark, especially if you're coming from Alpine skiing, the best part about that is you already have a pair of skis that's going to work. You know, I, I can confidently say that uh, because if, if it's a ski and it slides on snow and maybe you're strapped for cash and you want to get into it, don't let the ski thing hold you back. I would focus on the boot and the binding and uh, how that's going to kind of help you get in. And then you can easily mount to an old pair of skis. Granted, if it has too many holes in it, you're probably not going to be able to pull it off. But I mean, we do that all the time. People are moving from Alpine into Telemark. They've got a, an old pair of Alpine skis that they're willing to start Telemark skiing on. All we need to do is figure out which binding you're going to be using, take that hole pattern and sort of cross reference it on the ski. Now, if you want to get more specific with skis in terms of like, you really want to get a used ski that has specific features, our our overview on skis, what makes a good telemark ski, and we've done podcasts on this before, but you know, if you if you have the choice, get something that's traditional camber underfoot. It's got a little early tip rise, and the tail's not too dramatically uh, rockered or anything like that. Just a ba that's the basic go to shape and model that we're going to look for. 
traditional camber underfoot, early tip rise. And, uh, I wouldn't get anything, especially if you're a beginner intermediate, don't get, go anything too wide underfoot, you know, try to keep it like a hundred or less is a good place to start length of a ski. You may even want to go a little bit shorter on your first pair of telemark skis. If you're a beginner or intermediate, because again, you're elongating as you make a telemark turn, you're essentially making two skis into one long ski and, uh, less ski makes it a little bit easier to deal with. So you don't have to go all old school and get some crazy 200, you know, or a 190 or something like that. So, uh, and, and we're always available, you know, if you're like, Hey, you know, you write us or call us and say, Hey, just kind of curious, like what, here's my height, weight ability. And we can kind of walk you through like a general outline of what length of ski you may want to get, but I'm not going to go too deep into the skis other than give them a once over tip to tail, look for, follow the edges around. I usually literally start at the tip, follow one edge all the way to the tail, flip it over, look at the tail. That's where a lot of the damage can happen is in the, in, in the tail, especially people are slamming them on the concrete. You know, they get, they just, they start breaking apart. They start delaminating. And then I follow the edge all the way around. What I'm looking for is to make sure there's no edge missing. Uh, there's no blown out edges. Uh, those types of things. There's no uh, core shots next to the edge where there's big divots that may cause more damage down the road. And then I'm going to go tip to tail on the base and really look for have things been damaged by rocks uh, or other whatever may have happened. Did someone ski them across the parking lot? You know, that kind of stuff and kind of look at it like, Hey, is a simple tune going to, you know, make these great and usable or is this something I'm going to all of a sudden, you know, I bought a used pair of skis for a hundred bucks and or, t- you know, two, 300 bucks even. And then all of a sudden you've got like a hundred dollar edge fix that you've got to do. So it's just common sense. You know, skis are pretty, pretty basic, uh, but you definitely want to go tip to tail, follow the edges and look at the base. Uh, and you know, you can look at top sheets and stuff like that, but you just want to make sure there's no cracks in the sidewall. If it's a sidewall ski and, uh, just kind of go with that. But I will say, as you get into used gear, boots and bindings are where it's at. The quick overview on NTN stuff is there's more and more and more NTN stuff out there, which is beautiful because, you know, as you all know out there, I love 75 millimeter and this whole podcast has kind of been focused on that because that's a lot of what you're finding out there in the used market. But NTN stuff is the exact same way. Just apply the same method to the bindings and look at them in the same way, you know, once over, is everything functioning? Uh, are the cartridges operating? Uh, are there, are there cracks in the metal that might need to be looked at? Uh, those types of things. As far as NTN boots, same once over that you're giving it there. The only thing I would look at maybe differently from a a 75 millimeter boot is the second heel or the duck butt as it's referred to often. And that's the part where the NTN binding attaches uh, kind of mid foot underneath the boot. Just look at the wear and tear on that, you know, uh, make sure it's not shaved away too bad. Uh, especially if you see people that are walking on a lot of concrete and rocks, maybe they're backcountry skiing on, you know, doing a lot of mountaineering kind of stuff. That stuff can get really worn down and you just want to make sure because if it gets too worn down on an NTN duck, butt. uh, Every once in a while, you'll start seeing pre-release issues and stuff like that. And uh, the other thing, if you're buying uh, NTN bindings, is make sure it's large or small, okay? Same thing as with the cable bindings is you want to make sure the boot, if you're buying a combo from someone, for instance, which often happens, is you want to make sure that the boot fits in the NTN NTN binding. So uh, we can help you with the breakdown. Usually, it's at that, you know like a 26.0 Mondo and Scarpa, for instance, is a small NTN binding. A 27 is, uh, is a large NTN binding. So those are things to just, just keep in mind. So that was the deep dive into the used Telemark gear world. And I hope that helps everybody. Uh, it's kind of a quick method to just walk you start to finish about maybe some things to be looking at. And 
for those that maybe aren't uh, looking for used gear this season, this method is a really great checkup preseason too. And I, I wanted to mention that do a once over on all your gear, make sure the maintenance is done on it. Make sure you've got backup parts for things that may break. Uh, this is incredibly important because you want to go have a good time. You know, you take the day off to go skiing. The last thing you want to do is get up to that hill, go on that vacation and snap a heel lever or break a cable and not know how to find the part to fix it. Uh, you're pretty much on your own as far as parts goes when you get to the majority of ski areas uh, around the world is if uh, that heel lever is a great example. So uh, if you can't, uh, if you break one and you don't have a backup, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to find one at a resort. It just is what it is. Uh, and on that note, we are having a, another set of heel levers heading to uh, get anodized this week and we should have those back in stock in a couple weeks. So there's my pitch for your 75 millimeter heel levers and we'll have another batch ready to go before the resorts open and the backcountry adventures begin. So super fun talking to everybody. Uh, love Mondays. It's always such a great time to be here and, and talk about what's going on with Free Hill Life and all of our stuff at the retail shop and Bluebird and all that great stuff. So uh, hopefully that helped. I would love to get some feedback on this episode too. Maybe I missed something. Maybe uh, maybe you have something to add to the method that could make us better on our end of things as we also are always looking for hot tips to make us better at what we do. But we'd love to be uh, your preferred Telemark brand out there and retail shop. You can hit us up at freehealthlife.com on the web. Uh, customer service at freehealthlife.com gets you to our team to help walk you through stuff. And uh, we're really, really excited to kick off another season here in North America. And I know what we're going to be doing. We're going to be spreading telemark. We hope you are too. And uh, with that said, spread telemark always, my friends. See you next week.